You're listening to The Whole Church Podcast. Our efforts to educate and unite the church are made possible thanks to our sponsors on Captivate and on Patreon. You can get bonus content of our show on either of those platforms or on Apple Podcasts with a private subscription to the Amazal Ministries Podcast Network. Exodus 35, 10 through 19 in the Christian Standard Bible say, Let all the skilled artisans among you come and make everything that the Lord has commanded. The tabernacle, its tents and covering, its clasps and supports, its crossbars, its pillars and bases, the ark with its poles, the mercy seat, and the curtain for the screen, the table with its poles, all its utensils, and the bread of the presence, the lampstand for light with its utensils and lamps, as well as the oil for the light, the altar of incense with its poles, the anointing oil and the fragrant incense, the entryway screen for the entrance to the tabernacle, the altar of burnt offering with its bronze grate, its poles, and all its utensils, the basin with its stand, the hangings of the courtyard, its posts and bases, and the screen for the gate of the courtyard, the tent pegs for the tabernacle and the tent pegs for the courtyard, along with their ropes, and the specially woven garments for ministering in the sanctuary, the holy garments for the priest Aaron, and the garments for his sons to serve as priests. Here, Moses is having the children of Israel prepare the tabernacle in the way God commanded. We see everyone working together for crafts, tailoring robes, and decorating the worship area. Even though we're no longer under the law of Moses, as Christians, we believe aesthetics can play an important part of worship. Uh, Father Jonathan Rizmini, why do you believe God had the people of Israel put so much into the decor of their worship area? And what can today's church learn from that? Well... I think there is something to be said about uh, as we understand God as, of course, he's the good, the loving, but he's also beauty itself. And so by adorning our sacred spaces, spaces that we set aside for worship of our God, who is the beautiful, we are offering a reflection of that divine beauty and allowing our senses, in this case, our, our visual sense to be open so that perhaps in seeing with our physical eyes, we will begin to see with our spiritual eyes the divine majesty, which is being reflected through those beautiful things. Mm. Mm. Hey guys, welcome to the Whole Church Podcast, possibly your favorite church unity podcast. I'm Joshua Knoll. I am one of your hosts here with the greatest co-host to ever co-host. Um, when, when God gave man breath, he really did it to make sure that there was something to fuel the one and only TJ Tiberius on Black. Well, how's it going, TJ? Great. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, also here with a uh, fantastic return guest, one of my favorites and yours. Um, he, he has become the the. I forget how, what the term is, but he's now over the parish here in Charlotte's Holy Trinity Orthodox, Greek Orthodox Church. Uh, the one and only Father Jonathan. Father Jonathan, how's it going? I'm doing well. Uh, I think the title they gave me now is Dean of the Cathedral. Dean of the Cathedral. Uh, that sounds so cool. Proistaminos in Greek, which just means the presiding priest. So Ooh. now I am uh, also cool. in charge. <laughs> For yeah. better or for worse for these people. <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, we've learned it's a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I like to I like to keep... Father Jonathan is one of those guests where sometimes I just like to keep up with him. I'm like, yo, it's just good to hear and see how he's doing and hear from him. Um, which is why I like doing these series, because we hear from a lot of those guests that we like. We just like talking to. And uh, yeah, it's going to be a fun episode. Um, today we're going to be continuing our ecumenical aesthetic series you know we are doing this series talking about how art's used in various different churches because we believe that beauty and art can bring us all closer to god and closer to one another and it's also one of those things that uh the church is wildly different in from one denomination to another and i think understanding our differences can help us uh understand each other and come to close come together a little bit better so that's what we're here for we're going to talk about the orthodox church in its relationship with the arts and using art and worship yeah and check out the Amazon ministry podcast network uh, the link is below you can check out other shows like ours shows that we work with shows that we're friends with uh, just your good christian or christian adjacent content for y'all and uh consider supporting us by buying the merch link is in the show notes uh and it's just cool to 
you know, support your stuff out in public because other clothes don't really matter at all, you know? Yeah, yeah, that's pretty true. But also, <laughs> as we all know, I have a favorite form of unity that we start our show off with, which is uh, silliness. So I start this off with a silly question. We've done this before, Father Jonathan, and you know, we'll, we'll answer it first, give you time to think about it. This is a really specific one. What kind of art do you think Larry the Cucumber would most likely connect with? TJ, do you want to go first or you want me to go first? Yeah. Well, what do you mean by what kind of art? You know, I was intentionally vague just to see what you do with it. Oh, well, I came up with two answers. Me too. Cool. Uh, so I think Larry connects the most easily with music, naturally. Uh, okay. We know he does that. That's canon. And... Uh, <laughs> But right. I think as far as other art goes, I really think the painting he would associate himself closest with uh, is when he gets in one of those moods where he's like, oh, why doesn't anybody like me uh, doing stuff without me? Uh, it's probably like The Fallen Angel by like Alexandra Cabanel. Man. Good painting. It's yeah. literally Lucifer uh, after being yeah. cast out of heaven. Man. He would be, be in one of those moods. I am. Um, see, this is rough because I was going to answer mine kind of based on how you answered yours to see how we're taking how we're going to go with this question because you could have uh, if you did like an art type proper i might have actually said pixelization because you know he doesn't have hands makes sense that he'd connect with that um i think personality wise i mean this is it's so hard also you could just say uh superhero movies obviously he connects with that but I'm actually going to, I'm going to go with interactive art. Like, you know how you have those art exhibits that like show you a reflection of yourself or they like move with you or something. I think Larry is one of those where he needs to be able to interact with the piece. That's where I'm going. Um, Father Jonathan, <laughs> what um, kind of art do you think Larry the Cucumber is relating I to? I don't know who Larry the Cucumber is, so <laughs> this is a hard question. Oh, man. I think you've got it. That's fair. I think you... Um, how, how do you describe Larry? He's a cute like, from Veggie Tales. Yeah, that's fair. I feel like intelligent Patrick the Star. Uh, like if you give Patrick intelligence, I feel like you end up with Larry. Uh, I don't know, maybe abstract art. That's fair. I, I get that. It. Yeah, that's a fair answer. Yeah. All right. No. So he's from Veggie Tales. Says I, I think I heard yeah. that. Uh, yeah. I don't think I've ever ever watched an uh, Veggie Tales. So yeah, that's fair. Yeah, yeah. He, he's one half of like, the Veggie Tales duo. Yeah, yeah. It's a yeah, yeah. Phil Vischer voices the tomato. I forget who does um, Larry, or I have that backwards. I think that's true. Yeah. Oh. Anyway, so one of the main reasons we're doing this series is because of our belief that beauty can bring people closer to God and to one another. And I really, I feel like that's something the Greek Orthodox Church really gets because I've yeah. never seen a Greek Orthodox sanctuary that wasn't gorgeous. Uh, mm -hmm. But we have a few questions we're asking everyone in the series to go along with that belief. Uh, so could you tell us of a time where you've seen God in the beauty of creation outside? Mm. So uh, it's not a specific time, but it's a, a specific location, actually two locations. So I'm, I'm originally from Boston or just outside of Boston. And I make my way up by, by car at least once or twice a year. And there's a spot like right on the Virginia border because um, I always cut through the interior and it, it over it's just this kind of elevated mountain that you're kind of driving up. But you get a clear shot only when you're when I'm leaving Charlotte looking out where I can see off for miles and miles and miles of this just open space and seeing houses and cities and towns but because i can see so far I, I can see the way in which they are placed within the context of of the natural world and i can always see clouds and the sky and i'm usually leaving early enough in the morning where it's it's just a bright sky overlooking this whole creation where humanity has you know placed itself within the beauty of nature and um, and then the other the other spot is another highway spot. And I used to drive up to a summer camp in New Hampshire, 
uh, I would go there over the summer. And so I'd be driving back and forth uh, on my days off uh, so that I could like do laundry and stuff. But it was always on the way back. There was, again, this spot. And I can only see it on my way up because of the tree line driving back down. But there was this... It couldn't have been more than 20 seconds of wide open space overlooking mountain peaks. And in the wintertime when I would drive, you could also sk- see the ski resorts and the ways in which we, humanity kind of cut its way through that natural world but could not really overcome it. And I think in both of those instances, I'm just, I was just reminded of um, the vastness of God and, and, and there's something beautiful in, in, in awful like like i was filled with awe at that at at just the expanse of that and uh and and i think it's you can only you can only see it when when you have the largest perspective possible i think Uh, kind of like when you look off into the into the sky in the night and you can see the stars on the when you're like outside of the city and just see that vastness and there's something that makes you feel small but yet embraced at the same time um and i find that to be a a, a beautiful experience of an encounter with god in in the natural world yeah that is absolutely one of my favorite things to see is just how human humanity has integrated itself into the world and people a lot of people just don't get it they're like ah humans destroying the planet like yeah that is true but it's amazing to see like, well, we can't live here. We're going to change here because we want to stay here. Yeah. I think it's the difference of like, this is like a random weird kind of a pet peeve of mine of like modern day road construction, which goes straight through the mountain. Whereas some of those older roads that I find really beautiful, find a way to make the road kind of work with the mountain. And I think when we see our construction like our creation working with god's creation that's really a beautiful thing to see yeah so would you share a moment with us if you have one where you felt a special connection to a painting sculpture or another art piece it doesn't have to be religious it just yeah in in this case it will be so uh when i was in my i think my sophomore year of college uh I, i was very sick um and it turns out that I had a, a, a terrible case of appendicitis, but didn't realize it. And I waited so long thinking that it was like food poisoning or something like that, that uh, my appendix actually burst and I ended up in the hospital uh, oh. for emergency surgery. And um, it, had, it was so far gone and I had peritonitis in my, in, in, in my abdomen and mm-hmm. uh so uh, they, they, it was a, a long surgery, a long recovery process. My digestive system shut down. Um, and then towards the end of two weeks, uh, they began to be worried that they might have to give me a feeding tube and, uh, and like a colostomy bag. Thank God I didn't have to have that happen. But I just kind of had this moment of break, breaking down. And um, I had this icon in my dorm room of Christ of Sinai. And it's... Uh, it's an icon that's one of the oldest in existence. It's pre-iconoclasm, so before uh, there was a period of time in church history when uh, icons were being destroyed. Um, and it's one of the oldest remaining, and you can find it, the original, on, uh, on Sinai at the Monastery of St. Catherine on, on Mount Sinai. And, uh, and so I have, a, I have a, a replica of that. And uh, I remember after I, I began to pray after I got that news and some seminarians came in and were praying with me, and I asked my brother to get that icon. So he went all the way to my dorm room, and, you know, like half hour, 45 minutes away and brought it, brought it there. And I just remember standing there and just or sitting there in bed, you know, not having been able to move much, being in tremendous pain and just just looking at, at, at Christ's face. And there's a beautiful uh, the beautiful thing about this icon is there's uh, the way it's painted. It's almost like there are two sides to it. And the two sides represent the, like judgment and mercy. And uh, one is a sterner look and one is a, is a more gentle look. And for whatever reason, the only thing I could see was that gentleness. And I spent the whole night in prayer uh, from but when the sun went down to the sun came up. And I went from the day before them telling me I may never eat again on my own and I, I, I may, I may meet, you know, 
need surgeries throughout my life to everything turning back on. And I went home that day. Uh, you know, I didn't eat for two weeks and I could, I had three breakfasts that morning. So like, uh, so I had this encounter, uh, and I was inspired to pray and this, the icon became a tool in prayer, um, and kept me captivated in a way that allowed me without, without ceasing to, to pray for whatever God's will was for me to give me strength. If that was what was going to happen with the doctor's beard, uh, but also for healing, should that be his will as well. And thank God that was, that was his will. And, uh, I do have complications from, uh, from that, uh, from that illness still, but, uh, but thank God I've been able to live a, a relatively normal life since then. Wow. Yeah. Man, if this was just a Pentecostal podcast, we would have saved that for last and then had an ultra call. That's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. So there's been, oh, man, I don't know how to follow it up. There've been a lot of studies that showed, which I guess this is really relates to what you were talking about, that there's a healing aspect to seeing beauty. Um, I know for your case, it's more than just beauty in that story you were talking about, but um, do you believe there's a reason that God might've wired humans that way where like, perceiving beauty or hearing beauty can actually have a healing aspect to it. I can think I, it's, I was, uh, it's in, in the intro, I, I was mentioning that, um, that God is the beautiful. That's one of the ways we use to describe him. Of course, God is love. God is the merciful one. God is the good, uh, kind of as these like ideals. Um, and so I think because we, uh, being made in the image and according to the likeness of God, bear the capacity to receive those things. And I think w when we encounter the beautiful and we encounter God, who is the beautiful, there's a synergy that happens and we come to a fuller, um, a f a f a fuller sense of self. We, we, we are more in tune with we, ourselves as we are meant to be. And I think there is something inherently healing about that because it is, it's an encounter with God. Um, mm. And it, it, we are coming to, to that, we're coming to our creator, which is somehow both our, our beginning and our end. He's the alpha and the omega. He is, um, he is the, the source of everything, but it's, he's also that towards which we're all, tending we're, we're heading to him and we find our our end our telos in him mm -hmm. and so i think that en encounter with the beautiful has the capacity uh to to bring about healing because it's 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 a it is it's a return to that source that is also our goal so hmm. yeah fantastic answer big fan of that uh so before we get to the more unique aspects of the episode, uh, we have a segment we've been doing each time for the Ecumenical Aesthetic Series, and we call it the Artist Corner. Uh, so I have a few questions to pick from. Uh, I do it just in a random order. If we get to them all, great. If not, it's not a big deal. Uh, we have seven minutes to talk about whatever we want here. I like to try to do them all, but if it's not happening, it's not happening. So are you ready? Yes. Awesome. So do you prefer hymns or modern worship music? Uh, in liturgical settings, hymns, uh, I do find there's beauty and, uh, and I, have, I can have defined experiences in contemporary uh, worship. Um, but the historic hymns are kind of, that's what worship is like to me. That when I think of worship, it's those, those historic hymns sung in Greek or in English, or if I'm in another country or another community in whatever native language I find myself in. But uh, th those are what worship sound like to me. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So does your church have a flag? And if so, what do you know about it? Uh, a flag, uh, like a, like a, a, like a standard type thing. Like yeah. A, uh, not specifically um you might find uh in certain churches uh maybe in the old country you might find uh, a byzantine flag um which is like a yellow flag with like a double-headed eagle uh like the symbol of the byzantine empire just because of our historic connection to byzantium 
in the uh, in the U.S., you might find uh, the uh, the flag of the nation state from which uh, that church has its origin. So on on our site, we have uh, a Greek flag uh, for that, but then also, of course, an American flag. Uh, we don't pr put place them prominently within the church. Uh, these are like at our courtyard, um, but they but they are present at, at certain times, and we do celebrate you know national holidays of the old country along with the national holidays of the of our you know our new home in the united states uh, but they're often coupled with worship and some of them are connected with religious feasts as well so mm -hmm. so what is the most unique piece of art that you've ever seen or heard mm -hmm. that's a good question um, yeah. it's a hard question right yeah I don't think it's it's unique, but I'm reminded. So I, 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 there's this monastery mountain uh, in Greece called Mount Athos. There's like 20 monasteries there. And one summer I happened to be there for a big feast day, like the celebration of the patron saint of that particular monastery, which is over a thousand years old. And they were the, they were doing an all night vigil and that vigil lasted like 17 hours. So it's like when we say all night, it was all night and then into the next day. And at the beginning of the Vesper service, which is the evening service, but also like the first service of the day following the Jewish uh, practice of the day starting in the evening of the night before, uh, we, we chant uh, a section of Psalm 104. And it's called the Anik Sandaria because of like, um, because of the line from the, from the, uh, from the Psalm. And, um, and it was, it was two hours long for just like half of the song. And it was like, I wasn't sure if I was in heaven or on earth at that moment um, because it was just so beautiful and ethereal and we were all together and the whole community was just entranced and focused on God in that moment. And it's not any more unique than any other hymn, but I think the whole context of, of how it was it was chanted and and what we were doing it for just made it all the more profound yeah yeah that sounds amazing mm -hmm. uh, does your church have any statues that we could discuss uh, we do not have a tradition of statues in the orthodox church cool uh so does your church have stained glass and if so what's on it so it's not normal, a uh, normal artistic expression for orthodoxy to have stained glass. But here at the cathedral in Charlotte, we do have stained glass. Some of it is just colored glass. Uh, and people ask about its significance. And I say, I think they just wanted pretty colors to shine through. Uh, but then there's also some icons uh, of, of different saints. Uh, I think like St. John the Baptist is on one. Uh, on one side, it's male saints, and on the other side, it's female saints. And uh, they just kind of take the place. They're like in, in line with also a series of icons as well. So it's icons and then the stained glass with icons on them all in a row. But it's, it's not an, a usual practice in Orthodoxy to have them. Hmm. So what kind, what kind of wall decor is around your church and what is its significance? Your church is kind of large, so you don't have to say it all. <laughs> yeah, so essentially in, in Orthodox churches, you'll, you'll, especially ones that have you know been around for a while, you'll start to see them just covered in almost every inch with some type of iconography, uh, uh, saints and scenes from the life of Christ. Um, and then, uh, and then there's there'll be like designs and patterns, kind of tying those those icons together. And uh, the significance historically is um, there was the church also grew up in a time when not everyone was literate, so there is an educational aspect to it. So an icon of the life of Christ will show a scene like the nativity, like Christ's birth, but it'll give every every part of the story you'll like you'll see the magi in it you'll see the shepherds in the field you'll see christ in swaddling clothes you'll see the the ox and the donkey that are alluded to in the prophets um you'll see the manger in the cave um, you'll see the virgin mary you'll see joseph so you'll see uh, like the whole story uh in a single in a sin single icon uh, as a means of communicating 
um, something. Or a, an icon of a saint will, even if you can't read the name of the saint, you'll kind of get a sense of their story because there'll be features like if they're holding a cross, it means that they were a martyr for the faith. Or if they have a big forehead with, uh, with just a little, a little patch of hair, it means that they were wise because they're not really, they're not depicting the person uh, as they existed uh, historically. They're, they're, they're depicting them as they relate to God and kind of in the heavenly spaces. So it's educational, uh, and it's also, they're also tools to direct our attention to God. Um, so. No, that's awesome. Yeah. That was that's exactly actually fascinating. seven minutes. That was exactly seven yeah. minutes. That's crazy. But also fascinating about like, they're not depicting people how they look, but rather just how they were like the cross meaning martyrdom. I never knew that. I just knew some of them got to hold a cross, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's really beautiful because like, at least we have like photographs because they're contemporary saints that lived in our lifetime. And uh, and uh, and when we make an icon of them, they don't necessarily not look like they looked when they were alive because we have photos of them. But yeah. th that's not what's given priority. We don't try to like photo replicate them. We yeah. They fall into like standard patterns and uh, for like, there's, there's like a language to the icons, like the way that they're supposed to look and the features that they're supposed to have. So it's not just an artistic expression. It's, it's a, it's a language of communicating theology. Yeah. That's, the, yeah. Yeah. The Greek Orthodoxy always seemed like the, the maximalist like <laughs> denomination to me. It's like you walk into a Greek Orthodox church and there's stuff to look at. There is a, that reminds me, there's this movie to. that came out a few years ago, like the five year engagement, um, with Emily Blunt was in it. And the, the guy from, uh, I think it was from how I met your mother. I forget the first oh, Marshall. Oh, yeah. No. Yeah. And, uh, and so they're, uh, Marshall. at the very end, they finally like, they're just going to, we're going to get married. And so they're like, what type of service do you want? And they go through, it's like Christian. And then it turns to a guy that's clearly Orthodox, extreme Christian. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, extreme Christian. I like that term. You guys should just claim it, you know, <laughs> the extreme Christians. No, um, <laughs> just don't switch yeah. it around. Yeah, yeah, that's that's fair. So this is technically a follow-up question, but I wasn't told I can't do that. So you, your church doesn't do statues. Do y'all do like carvings in the walls ever though? Is that? There different? are some reliefs. Um uh, the the people listening won't be able to see it, but like uh, like well, th th there's like a little cross here that I wear, yeah. and inside of it, it's it's slightly carved. But it, there's there's rules about it. Uh, I think the protocols that we have are like it can't be more than like one third uh, or something like that exposed. Like like it can't it can't yeah. be it can't be like a fuller carve than a certain percentage or something like that. Hmm. Uh, but we do reliefs, but uh, but they're they're not like a normal feature in every church. Wow. Yeah, good to know. Cool. So like, good to know. Know. there are reliefs, but only this deep. <laughs> yeah, further than that, and it's too close to a sculpture. Yeah, yeah, that I mean, makes sense to me. Um, so, Father Jonathan, a lot of our listeners um, they're more from the evangelical Protestant traditions. A lot of the time, you know, we do have some Catholic listeners and stuff too, and I assume some Orthodox listeners. It's hard to get that kind of detail. It's easy to get like age, gender. I don't know why it's so hard to find out people's religion. Anyway, yeah, your tradition is more comfortable with the arts being involved in your worship areas than some of our evangelical counterparts. Um, do you think this difference in worship contributes to why some people are uncomfortable attempting some like ecumenical service kind of stuff? You know, it's a, it's a certainly a possibility. I mean, we, the, the reality with the, like any ecumenical dialogue is we have to be willing to receive people as they are. Um, and if that's the, the biggest challenge that I've seen is there is there can be people can view it as like second commandment violations and therefore question our Christianity. Which is, it's hard to be, it's hard to receive another when they keep, they may not be able to even acknowledge the Christian faith that we we have because they, um, because they, they because of their their conceptions of what the, what a second commandment violation is or their conception of what it is we do with icons and how we utilize them as tools in worship, but but you know not understanding 
you know, what, what, what those ways are. And then also not, not giving us the grace to know, like, We've, we've had the same scriptures as they have. Uh, <laughs> and I mean, historically for longer, only if you think that the Orthodox Church has its origins in the, in the early church. And so it's not something that we haven't wrestled with. Like we've had, we've had the question, like, how is this not in violation of like this, the second commandment to not establish, or not to have any gra- uh, graven images. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it, part of it is just our understanding of what, what idolatry was historically versus what it is that we do. And so, I mean, I I don't think I've ever had someone not want to come in. And I think we're pretty welcoming when people do come. I know Josh, you've come a couple, at least once, not twice, to the worship services. And and so it can be, but again, it's not an essential aspect. Like, I mean, I don't need a, 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 a church space that's adorned with all of those icons in order to, to engage in worship. Um, and I think sharing ecumenical space for prayer can can happen in a lot of different ways. Um, yeah. Okay. So, how would you describe to people who aren't used to art in their place of worship why your church believes that you know you should have them? Yeah, I think um, so. Part of it comes again to that the theology that emerged. Um, during the iconoclastic period will, will really, really be helpful. So that there was a period of time when there was a, a deep concern about the, the use of icons and in, in Orthodox in churches. And this is you know, not Orthodox in the, in the, uh, in the denominational sense, because it was even pre schism from the, from the West and the East. Um, but the, the idea was that if God became incarnate, it means that, material reality has the capacity to bear God in, in, in a way um, where things can be sanctified and they can, they can, they can communicate God's grace. Um, and so uh, the reason that we have art is because we find them to be useful in worship and teaching. Um, and because God became incarnate and Christ is the express image of the father. Therefore we have the capacity to image him. We can, we can, we can, you know, do a depiction. And again, it's not a historical, Mm -hmm. not like a a reproduction of his, his actual look. It is, it's, it's, it's a, it's a means of communicating theology um, for people to see. And one of the, one of the things that's communicating is we have, we believe in a God that was incarnate a God who is outside of time and space, the creator of all things, who is the uncreated, freely chose to enter into his creation and take on humanity and begin to live humanly for our salvation and therefore sanctifying material reality. And so material reality has the capacity to bear God and bear God's grace and communicate God's grace. And so we don't see there to be any any difficulty in, in utilizing that reality. As I said before, mm-hmm. it's, a, it's an opportunity for us with our physical eyes to be stimulated through what we see in the same way sounds can stimulate our ears or, you know, we, we use incense in our worship that, that mm-hmm. give us like touch our sense of smell. The idea mm-hmm. will be that by, by our, our physical senses being utilized, perhaps our spiritual senses will be open and we'll begin to see how God is acting in the midst of the world uh, at all times because he's everywhere present and filling all things. Yeah, yeah. I am. Um, I talked about early in an earlier episode, um, the Celtic Trinity knot is one icon for me. And it's, it's almost like when I think of the Trinity, I don't think in words mm-hmm. as much as I think in that photo because I can't in words describe three things that are separate, but also one thing. Like I just doesn't, to me, those words are contradictory. But if I think in that image, it's almost like it just makes more sense. Um, Is that, is that similar to when you, when you use these photos to depict more of a theological idea, as opposed to what people literally look at, is that a similar kind of concept? Yeah, potentially. It's also like, we see them as like windows into heaven where somehow like the, the image, um, uh, communicates communicates the the personal energies of the one depicted, but 
where it's where it's not we don't believe that like say the icon is the saint or that Christ is the icon or anything like that that would like lead us into like very quickly into idolatry but we some I, I, the way I like to, to to look at it and we have a, we have contemporary examples outside of Christian practice outside of worship practice and I always say to people it's it's kind of like like when someone passes or you miss someone who's at a distance and you have a photograph of them you might like talk to the photograph you might kiss the photograph you know like i don't think that my loved one my grandmother let's say who passed away is the photograph but somehow the the kiss that i give to her cheek in the photograph is somehow communicated to her who is alive in christ uh, because she died in Christ, and it's the same thing with the saints. And so, it, it is a commu- it, it is a means by which we can enter into the heavenly spaces. Um, yeah, that makes sense. Like a lot of people keep something that like smells like a loved one, or um, for for me, and I think this is probably pretty common. Recreate a dish that someone who passed on before used to make because it's like something about just that engaging your senses it's almost like they're there but that you know they're not there but it's almost like they're there yeah yeah there's something again it's like a personal energies we all we all have personal energies that we communicate to one another and uh you know because people are alive in christ their 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 personhood doesn't cease when their physical body dies uh it is just in god's embrace and you know we're we're a church of course that believes in the resurrection uh, not just of Christ, but of, of, of you know, all all will be resurrected uh, at the second coming, and so it you know it is it is a means by which we can continue to relate to someone's personal energies, though their physical presence might not be there. Um, yeah. Hmm. So there are a few unique practices and icons in the Orthodox Church. We wanted to ask you about in particular today. Uh, one unique thing with the Orthodox tradition that you know, Eastern Orthodox tradition is how the denomination's got the Russian Orthodox and Greek and Moldovan, I think is one that there's a few different ones. Uh, so how does the art in each different Orthodox church reflect themselves? Yeah. So there, there's certain things that will be very similar. Um, sort of like the Antiochian, uh, the Greek, um, the really like the Mediterranean uh, Orthodox uh, and Aegean Orthodox traditions, um, the, you know, the, they'll share like a common Byzantine style, a style that was kind of it became normative during the during the the height of the Eastern Roman Empire and you know centralized in Constantinople, present day Istanbul, and so a lot of them will have very similar artistic expressions. Although we're not in communion with them, uh, the Coptic Church will have something similar, um, but the but it, it'll look more Egyptian. They're like just like kind of the stylized, the way that they're stylized is again, it's not like a photographic representation, mm-hmm. uh, but the but it, it, you can tell the difference. Like it looks Ethiopian uh, or looks Coptic, and the Ethiopian Church will again do the same thing, but they'll you know maybe they'll depict Christ with darker skin or something like that, and it'll, it'll reflect kind of the expressive art of that culture. The Russian and the, the Slavic churches in, in general, some will have a Byzantine style. Others will, you know, some of them were influenced uh, by their by their connection to the West in the like the 19th century, 18th century. And so they might have a little bit of a slightly more Western style. It's still stylized, um, but the style, but it's not as stylized as uh, it is. You'll find in like Byzantine art iconography. Mm-hmm. Uh, where like the features are very elongated, they don't look like human beings look. They're very thin in some areas. Their faces are long. Their mouths are small. Um, it, 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 it's it's hyper stylized. Um, it'll be slightly less in the Russian church, and then also, also like arch- architecture as a, as a means of expressive yeah. art might be a little different. There's kind of like a standard way of of producing an Orthodox church. It's usually a modified basilica which is a basilica is like a, a narrow rectangular structure where it'll be in cruciform. So there'll be two, uh, two sides that f- uh, flare out in the, when you're looking at it from above, it'll look like a cross and there's usually a dome. And in that dome is an icon of Christ, the Ponto or the, the ruler overall. There'll be an apse at the back um, with the Virgin Mary, um, the, like the, the ladder of Jacob, the, mm-hmm. you know, the, 
the midpoint between the heavenly and the earthly spaces. The domes will look different shaped in the Russian Orthodox tradition, in the Slavic tradition, than in the Greek, par- partly because uh, they needed sl- they they did a dome, but they needed something more pitched in a in a in a climate that has more snow than Mediterranean climates. Ah. Mm-hmm. So they they have those onion shaped domes uh, as a practical feature, I, I would say, because of the the need. For, yeah. It's just because of the climate. Yeah, yeah. that's why we'll the see. Kremlin looks like that, Josh. Oh, yeah, I didn't so know the, that. Yeah, so snow doesn't just sit there. Yeah, I know. I had visited, obviously, I visited Father Jonathan Church, but I, I went to a, a Russian Orthodox Church once. I, I want to say that was in the Charlotte area too, but I'm not sure. There is one here in Charlotte. Yeah, but it's. I think yeah, the architecture stood out, and then the the color scheme really stood out to me. Like like I, I don't know how this makes sense, but to me, your church looks more Greek. Like the colors feel more Greek. The no, Russian church, blue. yeah, that color, yeah. I think it's like the red in the Russian church. I'm like, this is this is very Russian. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, mean, I think it makes sense. Anyway, um, another unique image we wanted to mention. Um, you mentioned it earlier, actually. There's the double-headed eagle from the Byzantine kind of connection. Um, there's mm-hmm. on some different flags and different, you know, emblems, whatever. Um, yeah. Also, I know. The, I, th- I think no, the Greek flag has the the blue with the white cross on it, right? Is that right. something? Okay. But um, back to the double-headed eagle. Mm-hmm. Do you know what that image represents, or like what that image is about? By any yeah. Chance? So it, it refer, the two heads represent the church and the state, uh, and there's usually a crown uh, over the top uh, they, that both are under the, the authority of the crown. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes in one of its talons, it has a sword representing kind of the military might of the empire. Sometimes it's a, a staff representing, again, authority, and it's usually holding a globe. Um, with a cross over the top to say, like representing the world under Christ's authority. Um, so it, it's just kind of representative of a unified, um, like two two heads of authority: the, yeah. the church and the and the state. Yeah, it looks really cool. Like <laughs> I don't know how to say that. Like some of the other ones, um, the Anglican flag, I feel like looks very. Anglican like it looks very English and I like some of the other flags but like when I was looking at the ones that has like that that eagle image I'm like this eagle looks so cool <laughs> like what is this about when it's I also at, on the Albanian flag yeah yeah like and that's, it's that's all the red flag yeah. Is, yeah 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 it's red and black really really cool yeah I'm reminded uh when I was at seminary we were considering like we didn't really have sports teams I and mean, we used to at the college the college on the same campus used to like be division three basketball or something like that. But yeah. we were like trying to think of a mascot. And so for the college, it was Hellenic college. So very Greek. So they wanted uh, the owl. Um, but for Holy Cross, we were going to do the, the, the Byzantine Eagles. And it was like yeah. a caricature <laughs> of a Byzantine Eagle with two heads. So that'd be pretty uh, sick. It, that so would one of be my cool. friends was a graphic artist. So he made it. It, it looked terrifying, but really <laughs> yeah. cool at the same time. Yeah, I That's think an more important part of a mascot. logo should look terrifying. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it needs to be intimidating. That's like yeah. the point. Yeah, you would think. <laughs> yeah, but uh, one practice for the Greek Orthodox that may be different for some listeners is how you include singing and chants throughout the homily. Uh, can you describe how that's done and why it is that way in your church? Uh, chanting during the homily, you said. Yeah, well, not or, or during the service. I think the yeah, during, during service, the service, not the homily. Service. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, I mean, the, the majority of our, our church services are, are made up of, uh, uh, well, there, there are hymns that will be chanted that are kind of, that rotate. We have like every day of the year is de- dedicated to a different saint or group of saints. So th- those will change throughout the year, uh, day by day. And then that we're on an eight week cycle. <laughs> hymns uh for day to day and then um uh, and then those are placed within a like a skeleton structure of a, of a church service which is constituted by prayers and verses uh, mostly taken from scripture and a lot of so we'll do ref, like a refrain from the psalms uh or the prophets or something like that followed by a hymn uh, during the, litur- the liturgy like the, the the eucharistic service that we'll do on a sunday um, uh, again, it'll be those same things like hymns specific to the feast. It'll be like some of it will be petitions, but the responses are done, um, 
they're sung rather than uh, read. Mm -hmm. um, and then even our scripture reading, um, if it's done in, in a more traditional style, will be will be chanted. Like we will chant the reading of scripture just to say that it's it's not just something regular that there's something sacred about this mm -hmm. and so we utilize our voices um to communicate that and the and the hymns are, are there's there's different tones like modes of uh like keys that we'll, we'll chant in and sometimes we'll be like singing along and it'll be in a in like a enharmonic tone which is very similar to like a like a regular um major scale but like when we sing about something sad or dark or fearful we'll switch into a more sharp chromatic tone to, to accentuate the words uh, yeah. of the hymn or of the, uh, of the psalm verse or something like that as a means of further communicating the significance of the piece. Yeah. yeah. And it's actually a lot of our theology historically was communicated in the hymnology of the church. So like we, we say, if you really want to understand the church, just read the hymns, particularly of like, like the morning service on Sunday, like everything we believe about the re resurrection and life to come, you'll see chanted uh, in, in the hymns that we do. Um, and like there are hymns that are called like dogmatic hymns where like it full, it like communicates like a very deep theological concept, but in music and some of our hymns, like the Christmas hymns were just like cut up pieces of a, of a, of an, of an oration of St. Gregory. Like we, they just took his words, like this beautiful poetic words of St. Gregory and set it to music to, com and it was just like about like, well, this is what we believe about the incarnation. So yeah, I would love to do an episode about musical intentionality because it's there. So we can do that. <laughs> yeah. My, uh, I have a friend I work with and you know, he's young because I work at Chipotle. We get a lot of youngins. Uh, he was talking about he's taking a music history class for his high school, you know, in high school right now. And he, it just really annoys him because every day they're talking about like ancient religious music. It's like, yeah, that's most of music history <laughs> is yeah. religious music. It's just the way it is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Are there any like Orthodox specific images or icons that you find special significance in that you could share with us other than the one you already shared with us? Yeah. Um, so uh, one's just really cool because it's it's the most recent addition to our cathedral. Um, so our, our cathedral is Holy Trinity, and you, we uh, traditionally you do not depict the Trinity like as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, you might find ones where there's like two figures, one specifically very much looking like Christ, the other one not looking like Christ, uh, but representing Christ, but like as the father, he's not, it's not an icon of the father. It's an icon of Christ as the ancient of days from Daniel and, and then, and then the Holy spirit in the form of a dove, but traditional icons of, uh, of the Holy Trinity are uh, a depiction of the hospitality of Abraham, the three angels in the old Testament. Mm, yeah. Um, and that represents the Holy Trinity. And uh, we so as part of our centennial celebration, because we just uh, on the 23rd of September was our, our 100th year, the, the day of our 100th anniversary. And uh, as part of that, we, we made an icon uh, of a Holy Trinity icon. And uh, it's really cool. So uh, 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 above it's the three angels from the hospitality of Abraham. And they're kind of holding uh the facade of our church building oh, that's cool uh, as it is that's now really cool. and then below that it's the we used when we first started 100 years ago we met in the chamber of commerce upstairs and so oh. there's an iconographic depiction of the chamber of commerce and then oh. next to that we used to have a we had an old protestant church westminster um presbyterian former presbyterian church on south boulevard here in charlotte and uh, that's where we were for the mid part of, uh, of like from the 1920s to the 1950s. And then we purchased the property where we are now. And there's so there's an iconographical de depiction of the church facade as it was in the, when it was built in the 50s. And the old Jones mansion, which is the state up, uh, on this block where we purchased that we used to meet in before our, our cultural center was built here. 
Uh, and so it's just like this beautiful history. And like down below, you'll see like people from that era, like kind of sort of depicted. And then in front of the one of the churches, the, the, the church as it was built in the, uh, the 50s, there's two children. One's holding an icon of St. Nectarios and the others of St. Luke. And our sister churches, the churches that kind of grew out of our original church, are St. Nectarios uh, in Matthews. Um, uh, 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 here in Charlotte and then St. Luke in Mooresville. And so it's just kind of a, like, a, it tells our whole church, like our, our particular community story. Um, but we're, but we were being held in the embrace of the, of the angels who, who to represent the Trinity. Yeah. That's mm-hmm. awesome. Yeah. That's, yeah, really that's cool. so cool. And that speaks yeah. directly to what we learned earlier in this episode is that we like to teach history with icons. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 So are there any, images or icons or sculptures from other Christian traditions that you found a special connection with? Uh, it's okay to say no, there's not many. I feel like Greek Orthodoxy has like just by far the most things to look at. Yeah, I mean, I mean there's some, like, like historic, like Western, like Roman, Roman religious statues that I think are just really powerful. Like you'll see them in, in, in churches. Um, uh, I think uh, we, we don't have a tradition of this um, in the in, in Orthodoxy necessarily, but like the like the stations of the cross as a as a meditative practice that the Catholics use. There's some Western Rite Orthodox, so that the, so there's you, your listeners may or may not know this. So there are there are Catholics that worship in a Byzantine style. They're called Eastern Rite Catholics, but then there are also Orthodox people that worship in a Western style. Called Western Rite Orthodox. Um, in the Western Rite Orthodox, you'll actually they have a, a practice of doing the stations as well, uh, but the stations are icons rather than than sculptures. But uh, but in in Western churches and Catholic churches, you'll you often find like the stations of the cross as statues along the wall. They can walk along and meditate um, on, on the on the, the steps that Christ took on his way to his passion. Uh, and I, th- I think it's just like, it's a beautiful, I, 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 my doctorate's in practical theology. So I study Christian practices. And so like that is like the, the fact that, 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 that particular set of statues has like a practice associated with it, I think is really powerful because it communicates not just by what's depicted, but like how you use it mm-hmm. as its own, it communicates it's a, 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 a theology as well. And so mm-hmm. I think that's really powerful. Yeah. yeah that's, that's awesome. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah, I learned earlier that uh, I apparently really appreciate the Anglican emblem, where it's like mm. the the compass with the um, the mitre on top, mm. or the mitre, however you say that. Just that the idea of like global outreach being so centered, which is funny from a very English centered church, but <laughs> you know, it's fine. Yeah. yeah. So outside of uh, paintings or statues, you know, usually we do a practical question at the end of like what can engender unity um, for this series. We're asking outside of paintings and statues, what's one kind of art that you think people might be able to get into that would help them draw closer to each other and closer to God um, outside of like yeah, painting statues, you know, uh, I think digital media, um, like uh, podcast, <laughs> yeah, podcasts, um, <laughs> a film. I mean, like if film is film is a medium, like, some of the most powerful like religious expressions I've seen have been have been through film or, or television. I mean, I, I, whether whatever your opinion is of, of like the um, the chosen, like the, like like that as an artistic like the, the the series as film, like as an artistic medium for communicating at least aspects of the gospel. I think are, it's really powerful and like. You, you, you see people that are moved by it across denominations. And some people are moved yeah. like an outrage against it, but at least it's a conversation <laughs> starter. Yeah. Um, and then, and then film in general, like some, uh, there's been some very powerful movies communicating orthodox, like ascetical, like, um, uh, like, uh, uh, spiritual practices, uh, um, some from Russia and stuff like that, but they they can yeah. watch them dubbed or or, um, or with subtitles, and it really communicates like our our theology and spirituality really well. And, and I've seen the same thing with uh, with you know Protestant spirituality and and practices communicated through through mediums of, of film, uh, and then documentary documentaries as well, like a, a, like a less mm-hmm. like 
less entertainment value, more kind of educational value, but still, I, I think it's a really profound and, you know, I think we will probably see, we're already seeing it being used more and I, I hope that we continue to see it. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I honestly don't like a lot of Christian movies, but there's, I, I think it's called Risen where it was the, uh, the Roman guard trying to investigate what happened to the body and all this stuff whenever mm -hmm. Jesus came back. And there's this like, and I mentioned this a lot, but there's this one specific image where he sees the disciples together laughing. And there's just this picture of them being joyful to me that just kind of, you know, some images just kind of like get stuck in your head. And for me, that's just that image of them laughing. Cause it's like, mm -hmm. I guess so often, you know, those, I mean, you might not know, but a lot of the churches that I grew up in, they did these like little videos of Jesus and the disciples and they're always so stoic all the time. Mm -hmm. And just to see an image of them laughing just stood out to me so much. And it just, I don't know, it, it touched my heart. Yeah. 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 I, I think a lot of modern Christian filmmaking gets really bogged down with trying to be involved in like the culture war and identity uh, politics. Yeah. And that makes That's a lot true. of them borderline unwatchable. Yeah, uh, just not good. Yeah. But, you know, when it's good, it's good. We get like the passion of the Christ or something. Yeah, I mean the passion itself. Like I, I, I didn't grow up in the. I don't know if I, if I ever talked about this when like we first. I mean we've been doing this for like forty four and a half years now. I think <laughs> you're one of the first uh, conversations I've had. I had, uh, and I mean I, I didn't grow up uh, going to church. I, I was you know baptized when I was young um, because that's what you did. Um, but I didn't like really have a conversion experience until much later. It's when the passion came out and like seeing that movie, I'm like, that's what he did in 12 hours. Like what else did he do? And it's like, I immediately went out and bought a Bible and uh, I didn't, I didn't know where to go from there. And like, that's what started me on the, like this journey. Like, I'm standing, like sitting here talking to you both today because I saw that movie, uh, you know, oh, wow. almost 20 years ago. So, uh, it's, it's remarkable how, how something. And I didn't even see it because I had some like faith connection to it. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. I liked history, so I'm like, oh, I'll go see that movie. It's all it's all in another language. That's even cooler. And then next thing I knew, I'm like studying to be a priest. I was a professor for <laughs> years of theology, and now I'm you know I'm I'm uh, the priest at one of the largest parishes in the country. And it's just like, wow. Oh man, yeah, we're gonna have to do that episode of a. Uh... Well, you know, this could be like a crossover with systematic geekology. We're doing our year of origins. We do the origins of Father Jonathan. It'd be fun. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so if everyone stopped and took the time to appreciate these like good Christian films, uh, what do you think would we, we would see change in the world? Oh. Or if we just made good, more good Christian films? Yeah, if we made more good Christian films, that would be a start. Yeah, so but far it's like, like Passion and Pinocchio. Yeah. Prison. I think um, I think like one of the things that we probably like I, I think we, we've just been conditioned in this age to receive messages better through through film, mm -hmm. and so if we could if if there were good films available like that were that were worth seeing, like even like I said like I didn't go see The Passion as a Christian I, I saw it as like for be, you know for better or. For lack of a better term, I was an atheist seeing that movie, but I was still moved to see it uh, just because of the, uh, like how it was, you know, like the interest around it. Um, but like if, if, if more people saw it, you know, at least, you know, like open up opportunities for conversation. And, and you know, sometimes it's like it's a striking thing to like, like to see Christ crucified in, in film. Like, like I knew he was crucified, but then I like, like just hit, like everyone knows that Christ was crucified, but like to see you know, like what that could have looked like, yeah. And be, like I was struck, I was like convicted. I'm like, like that was my immediate response to it. Um, but I, it was I, like, I don't think I, I'm like like just a simple piece of art would have done the same thing to me, because I'm, I just wasn't conditioned to receive uh, receive that message, in in. in just from like a standard painting or something like that. I, I, I grew up in a time when I think everything is communicated through, uh, through like digital media, through images, yeah. through, uh, through the picture, film, like those type of things. Um, so I think that I think it, it would just it would probably reach more people, particularly if it wasn't like yeah. crummy quality or, or bad writing. <laughs> Trying really hard yeah. not to name specific movies that uh, yeah, I did, I did want to say came it. out of Georgia, but um, 
<laughs> the I'm, I'm gonna give my own really specific answer to this if specifically a christian made a movie of the hunchback of notre dame like the book the victor hugo book if they were to make that movie and make it the same quality of lame is i think it would force the church to look at themselves in the mirror and we'd have to come together to fix some things that's mm -hmm. what i think yeah 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 uh, so before we wrap up, we'd like to ask everyone to share a moment where they saw God recently, whether it be from a blessing, challenge, moment of worship, whatever it may be. Uh, I always make Josh go first. So, Josh, do you have a God moment for us this week? I always have plenty. Um, this time I'm going to go back to, to doing a, a Chipotle one. Yeah. Welcome um, back. Yeah, thanks. This is kind of a, a challenge, I guess. Um, a guy was brought into our store Monday morning, and I saw him on the schedule as a position that I was hoping to get. And my first thought is, oh man, I can't get this position. This guy is here. And I was immediately upset about it and was like, yeah, I'm not going to say anything. You know, people told me I might get this position, whatever, but I'm not going to, I'm going to keep it to myself and just going to be upset for the day and it'll be fine. And then as soon as I meet the guy, and this is where the challenge comes in. The first thing he says is, oh, you're Joshua Noel. I'm here to train you for this position. I was like, oh, cool. Hmm. Yeah. I'm <laughs> glad I didn't say anything. <laughs> Kind of challenge that I got upset a little too early. So, yeah, challenge and a blessing. There we go. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. 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 Uh, I'm also in my own little challenge, Chipotle challenge right now. Our, our general manager is on vacation and I have the by far the most experience in the store now. <laughs> so you now everyone thinks I'm the general manager. It's like, no, I make like I don't even make $16 an hour. Go talk to someone else. This is I'm intentionally getting paid too little to to deal with this question. Yeah, <laughs> you're because you could have moved up. You could be in the position that I want. Yeah. Yeah. You just don't want to work at night. Yeah. 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 But no, but for real, for real, uh, I have a friend, an actual God moment. I have a friend that I haven't seen in a, a very long time because, uh, you know, he's got a bunch of stuff going on and he just kind of showed up the other day. And we got to, it's my roommate. Anyway, he showed up the other day and we got to talk about it. And, you know, some things happened a couple months ago. And, you know, we have cats, their litter boxes in his closet. Uh, somehow his closet door got closed. And so they needed a place to, to go. And they chose his bed, which had like all of his clothes on it. Oh. Yeah. So that was rough. And then the next time when he came back after that and found that out, that same night, mm. his uh, his partner got in a horrible car accident. So then he's mostly been taking care of her, oh. not here. So I did his laundry while it was gone because, mm. you know, you shouldn't have to deal with that. And uh, yeah. traumatic brain injury partner at the same time. So I just did his laundry for him and put it back on the clean bed. And when he came back, he didn't realize that they were clean. He thought that somebody had just taken all of the clothes that were covered in cat waste and put them back on the bed. Oh, so, uh, you know, communicate to people. Don't, if you're, if you're trying to surprise somebody, you know, communicate that you've done something for them. Cause a lot of times people won't realize it. Yeah. That's, that's a, the negative. Hmm, that's a good one. Effects. I feel like both of our God moments had a lot of a uh, strong literary irony to it. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't find that out until this last time that he came, by the way. This happened like months ago. Mm -hmm. Oh, great. Yeah. So, Father yeah. Jonathan. Yeah. God moment. Yeah. So, it's a really, so it was, it was a series of events. Um, so, I got, a, I got a text message from a uh, person that's connected with our church, but uh, primarily goes to the other church in town. Um, and it was like a, a group text between me and the, and the head priest at the other church to see who was able to, uh, the, the woman is from Spartanburg, um, uh, like an hour and a half away, I guess. Spartanburg um, mentioned, let's go. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and the, a parishioner that she knows from there, uh, is in the hospital here awaiting a transplant. Mm -hmm. And that she asked if it was possible for me to, or father, father Andreas, the priest uh, at St. Nectarios to go. And both of us were unable to, but father Christian, my assistant, uh, was available to go. And he went, uh, unfortunately the, 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 the person was, uh, uh, intubated and, and not, um, and sedated. So he went and spoke with the wife and, and the mother 
uh, of the of the person, um, but wasn't able to to do much for the person, like communicate with them directly. And um, then uh, yesterday morning, um, they were talking. Or early afternoon, they were talking. When he came out, he had, the, the intubation was taken out, and and he was uh, talking with his wife, and she mentioned that uh, oh, father came by, and the the nurse overheard it and asked if they were Catholic because they like that's the assumption, but they said oh no, we're Greek Orthodox, mm-hmm. and the nurse happens to be a parishioner here at the cathedral, and she asked if it was all right if I uh, if if she contacts me uh, to come. As so that he can, so I, I was able to go see him, and I prayed with him, and he received communion and all, and all of that. And I was talking with him a little bit, and his wife happens to be Palestinian, and we there was we weren't talking about any of the circumstances over there right now. Um, but I, I said, oh, I have uh, I was the best man in a wedding uh, in Palestine. Um, uh, and the, the bride of my, my very good friend is from a village just outside of Bethlehem called Pichala. And she said, that's where my dad's from. And so this Crazy. like, so, uh, so there is this connection. I was asked to go see a person unable to go. My, my assistant went, but he was not able to, to, he wasn't awake when, when he was there. And then one of my parishioners happened to be his nurse. And I was able to get there when he was awake. And, uh, and I happened to have spent three weeks in the village where this woman's uh, father is from. And then this morning she called again and I went to go see him again because he's going in for surgery today. Uh, not for the heart transplant, but for, for a, just kind of a surgery to help sustain him until the, he's able to receive a transplant. Um, but like all, like these series of like, coincidental events and i think it's it, it's in coincidence i i told her it, it's not coincidence it's providence mm, uh, providence yeah. is kind of god uh puts it, we're on a conveyor belt leading us towards god and these moments <laughs> uh uh of clarity allow us to realize just how he is he is he is pulling us towards himself um and so yeah that was my my moment of uh of uh yeah. of yeah. recognizing god's god's actions in the midst of the world that's yeah. that's pretty cool and i'm from spartan yeah. like those moments mm-hmm. that's <laughs> yeah also a connection but not as unique you know you know well, that, just tiny town outside of Bethlehem. i think, I think so that's, specific. That's, uh, that's actually a really good uh like like that's a, that just goes to show you everything is connected my whole weekend has been leading up to this moment so. yeah yeah we did get the rights to it's a small world for the outro right yeah we did yeah <laughs> Cost us six million dollars. Yeah, yeah, no biggie. <laughs> uh, that's amazing, though. That's crazy to hear. That is, yeah. I was just hanging out with one of like my only Palestinian friend a couple of days ago, before all this this news started flowing in. That's also cool. Uh, but yeah. yeah, thank you for listening. If you enjoyed the show, please consider sharing with a friend. Uh, share with an enemy. Share with your cousins, uh, and. You know, there there are paid subscriptions you can use to support us on uh, Captivate, Apple Podcasts, and Patreon for extra content. Uh, you can support us. Uh, you can also support us for free by, you know, liking. If you're on YouTube, subscribe it, share it. Just talk about it sometimes. It'd be really helpful. I'd appreciate it a lot. Yeah. Go to Shutterfly, print out a, the largest sized poster they have, put it in your workplace over the office door. That kind of thing. It's just casual stuff, you know? Yeah. yeah. Whole church yeah. vandalism. Also. <laughs> also, um, yeah, check out the other shows on the Amazon Ministry Podcast Network, um, AMP Network. You know, we have the homily with Pastor Chill Will from Chapel Hill. I do dummy for theology over there. Eventually, TJ is going to have a hockey show. Um, other friend of the show, Christian Ashley, he has a show over there, Let Nothing Move You. Um, all kinds of stuff. Check it out. TJ and I both do systematic ecology. Father Jonathan guested over there once, talked about D&D. So if you want to hear him talk about D&D, you got to go over there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we hope you enjoyed it. Come back next week. We'll be continuing the ecumenical aesthetic series with Pastor Joe Day about his experience with art in the church as he's worked both in and out of home churches. After this, we'll conclude the series with Professor Chris Moreland of the Catholic tradition to discuss the use of statues and other imagery in their church. And finally, that series is going to end. I feel like we've been doing this for seven years. 
Uh, it's mostly <laughs> because of Exodus 35. Uh, it's long. long yeah, it's long. But at the end of season <laughs> one, Francis Chan will be joining us. Hopefully. Yeah, he doesn't know, though. And we're going to have him read Exodus 35. Yeah. He's going <laughs> to suffer. Someone's got to tell him, though. <laughs> well, don't tell him that part. <laughs> yeah, no, he's going to have a great time, yeah. and we're not going to make him read <laughs> Exodus 35, 10 through 19. All right. See you guys. Thank you for listening to the Whole Church Podcast. Again, you could always sponsor our show at patreon.com forward slash the Whole Church Podcast or on captivate.fm or on Apple Podcasts. You can also leave us a one-time tip through Captivate. Thank you for listening.